Uh, joining me now for the hour, Kathy Jones, Charles Schwab, fi Chief, Chief Fixed Income Strategist. Also with us, uh, David Bonson of the Bonson Group, CIO and Managing uh, Partner. Guys, I had a whole lovely plan, and I'm throwing it out because we have this enormous deal. Morgan Stanley uh, buying e trade for $13 billion. Uh, David, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I uh, spent a good portion of my career at Morgan Stanley. I know the firm very well, have some of my closest friends there. And, and I can tell you it is a bit of a surprise. I think that um, Gorman is quite a deal maker. And, and this is not exactly when he got to like steal Smith Barney out of Citigroup at the bottom of the financial crisis. They spent about $2.7 billion for that unbelievably robust franchise. And now they're spending five or six times that on E-Trade, which used to run Super Bowl commercials with babies throwing money around. I mean, mm -hmm. it is so off-brand for the white shoe investment bank Morgan Stanley. Daily, I'm just stunned. Where they get like zero fees and a race to zero fees uh, to the bottom. But worse than that, because that speaks to an economic problem. Sure. I get it. Maybe that's why the stock's down three and a half percent. But what I would speak to, Alex, I'm, I'm highly confident in my view here, is the cultural problem. It, mm. Is that the clients of E-Trade are not looking for advice. So even apart from the fact they don't pay for trades, they're not looking to have intermediaries that are there to provide wealth management. The, the, the spectrum of the marketplace that is willing to pay for a more private level of asset management and financial planning is at a higher net worth level than where E-Trade is. So I think this is going to be a very diff difficult cultural merger for them. Yeah, David. Well, what I was going to say is that um, there's another element that I don't think people are talking about. It is, we're not running out of wealthy people, by the way, and that market is huge. And you see things like the, the Schwab TD trade. That's a custodial play on the RIA mm -hmm. space that I happen to be in where there are hundreds of billions of dollars leaving the Morgan Stanley's, UBS's, Merrill mm -hmm. Lynch's to go to independent fiduciary firms. There is no money going from independent fiduciary firms into the Morgan Stanley's, Merrill Lynch's. So this this becomes a, a sort of different strategy. Goldman Sachs bought United Capital last year for $750 million, not $13 billion. Mm -hmm. And that was a fee-based smaller RIA that was more downscale. So going, putting $13 billion into an entity like E-Trade, I think, has a, a really bold statement that they're willing to go very downstream, mm -hmm. but it requires a complete business reinvention relative to the culture. Remember, when they bought Smith Barney, and I was a legacy Morgan Stanley guy, not Smith Barney, they thought, the Smith Barney folks thought they were going downstream by joining the old Dean Witter. Okay, so now you're talking E-Trade. I would imagine their average account size is twenty or $30,000. That's, uh, that's, how, that's right. how downstream we're talking so, about here. This deal could have been done five, six years ago at less than half the price, no question. So that is a good question. What are the next deals there to be done? And on the discount brokerage side, if that were the strategic asset being bought, I would argue this is kind of the end of it. There's maybe some real smaller, fragmented players. But I think that it became a custodial play some time ago. That's certainly what Charles Schwab's buying in TD Ameritrade. Ameritrade bought Scott Trade before, which was mm -hmm. the last of the big um, uh, on discount online brokerage type entities. So I think right now the next big uh, moves of, of consolidation will take place in asset management, like we saw with the late Mason deal and then continued deals around the RIA space, this private wealth management arena. That's the part that's in early innings and is largely not in public markets yet. So is that what Goldman buys? Like, that's the thing. It's what, what they've Goldman already buys? bought. They were the so first to come to in. They bought more? United Capital. $750 million was a big premium to United Capital, but it was not a significant amount of money for Goldman. They certainly have the Treasury mm -hmm. to go invest meaningfully in the space. And, and if they believe that they want to be in the higher end of the pool with customers that have a more complex need in financial planning and estate planning and, and more uh, deep end of the pool as far as their asset management, certainly the RIA world is where they would go next. And Alison, before I let you go, um, are buybacks dividends at risk here for Morgan Stanley on um, this? It, one would think so. I mean, it's a pretty big use of capital. So, I mean, I think the, the other question that has to be resolved for Morgan Stanley, right, is that on certain measures, they have tons of excess capital, but we have rules, uh, you know, coming down the road um, that could sort of, you know, make that excess look a lot slimmer. And mm -hmm. so we're going to want to hear about those final rules. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think, um, obviously, this is a pretty big use of their capital. And, and one other thing I'll just add, just because we're talking about Goldman and United Capital and, and execution. But again, when Goldman bought United Capital, and I think that was part of the transaction that um, you know the head of United Capital said, you know, we, we, we talked to people that Goldman had, had 
uh, purchase. They had, you know, bought some smaller players. Um, and the fact that they were going to kind of leave that um, as an entity and not try to absorb it into Goldman, I think that's, yes. th- that's again, helpful from a cultural perspective. Yeah, I wonder, you were talking about E-Trade. And the then they thing. changed and the name of it to Goldman, Goldman about a month yeah. later. <laughs> sure. So. Uh, in terms of the market, we've been talking about the everything rally over the last few days. If you come inside the Bloomberg, you can take a look at the blue line, which is the MSCI All World uh, Index, versus the white line, which is the Bloomberg Barclays uh, Credit Total Return Index. You can also throw in maybe oil in there. You can throw in the dollar. You can throw in gold. And there you go. Buy everything rally. Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab and David Bonson, the Bonson Group, still with me. Kathy, what do you make of it? You know, I think this is driven by the notion that central banks can cure everything, right? That they can throw liquidity into the markets and therefore you should buy everything. You see it in credit spreads. They're like at the lowest level. Junk almost. bonds in Europe. Yeah. They're low. Yeah, exactly. And I think the problem, the problem I have with this is not just the valuation issue, which is, is pretty extreme in many markets, but it's also central banks can provide liquidity. They cannot cure disease. Right. They can't stop the coronavirus from spreading. They can't reopen these businesses. And so at some point you have to look at what are you paying for these assets Mm -hmm. relative to what the cure actually is for this. And that that seems to be time. David, I would argue that the issues in credit markets and the transitory and sort of short term issues around coronavirus are just completely separate conversations. Mm. I think that there is an overvaluation issue in the credit market. And uh, not just reliance, but I mean a full-blown addiction to liquidity Mm -hmm. that is requiring uh, uh, additional priming of the pump to maintain this sort of healthy credit environment. Um, It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, though. It's all good as long as they keep providing the liquidity. Once they don't, things fall apart. I don't know. It's impossible to time. But on the coronavirus side, it's perfectly sensible to me that markets, having gone through this over and over again for generations, would say we're not going to go blow up an asset allocation over something that may be four months, maybe four days. I think it's going to end up being somewhere in between. Well, but the, the issue is what price do you pay for those assets, right? It's okay to maintain your asset allocation, but if you're putting new money to work right. at all-time highs where valuations are stretched, your prospective returns are not going to be terribly attractive. But, that, but they were at all-time highs before coronavirus. Yeah, and, and now they're at even higher, even though we have a supply and demand shock coming out of the world's second largest economy. Strikes me, I mean, my position has been this is somewhat different than SARS and Ebola and some of the other things. Uh, you know, because of the centrality of China to the economy, because it's both a mm-hmm. supply and demand shock at the same time, it's going to take more time. It's going to have more economic impact. And the market was already priced at high valuations, and now it's priced at higher valuations because everybody wants to, to be in on it. It strikes me that certainly in high yield and some of these other markets, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be buying here. Yeah, if I thought there was going to be actual defaults coming as a result of coronavirus, I would agree, but I don't. Mm. And, and, and I think that the multiple between 18 and 19 of S&P is expensive regardless of what the headline is. Coronavirus will not be a headline at some point in the near future, and there will be another one. And, and 18 and 19 is still too expensive on a forward basis for the S&P 500, mm-hmm. whether it's coronavirus or the next trade flare-up or whatever the case may but, be. But, go ahead. My point is risk investors have said with a 10-year around one and a half percent and a fed and every other central bank on the planet mm-hmm. telling you we're going to do anything we can to prime the pump risk asset investors are saying we're willing to pay up for it our belief is you should work harder and find value that's obviously what we do but i am not confused as to why markets have sort of shrugged off coronavirus well and this is where i feel like your two points kind of intersect and the bank of america also kind of spoke about that the everything rally and said there were 13 rate cuts by central banks across the globe emerging markets will have to continue to do that because of the coronavirus etc. So then where is the value? Like, how do you not pay up too much, but also take advantage of uh, the liquidity and the buy everything mentality as long as you wind up having central banks in it? Top yeah, trade. I mean, so one of the things you can do is sort of barbell your positions. You can have some risk on assets, have some treasuries to go with it. Mm-hmm. And by the way, treasuries are rallying a lot, too. So you can you can sort of barbell it if you're going to. Um, our argument is this is not an opportune time to jump in and add to positions on the risk side. 
And so some could, it sounds that sort of an implied hold cash, and, and some could decide to go about doing that. That timing of things has not gone very well. But on barbelling, I think if one wants to make an argument 18 or 19 times as to expensive S&P, which I would, I don't know how one could say one and a half percent in a 10 year is not equally overvalued, perhaps much more so. I would not view treasuries as any less overvalued than the S&P. So I your question is where are you find they're a lot safer. Well, no. <laughs> you hold treasuries to maturity and you get your money back. It's not true if you hold an overvalued asset. Uh, you may not get your money back at the right. end. That's so what if I mean someone, if someone is content to hold a treasury for 10 years at one and a half percent and their spending mandate and their total return objective is content with that, I don't have any clients that that's the case for that are able to hold a 10 year treasury for a one and a half percent pre inflation, pre tax return. We have to deliver a premium above that. I think that in the energy sector, you have this story that can't seem to find oxygen, can't seem to find any sentiment. And yet you asked about where the value is. Mm. There's just no question that the fundamentals are disconnected from the pricing Mm -hmm. that can go on for a long time, just like overvaluation can go on for a long time. But do I believe that in the S&P, there are names of a high quality balance sheet and free cash flow generation that are at a deep discount to real intrinsic value? Yes, I do. There's not a lot else in the S&P I'd say that about response for you? Oh, well, I I guess my concern is certainly in the energy sector, um, you know, this is affecting energy quite directly. So um, crude oil prices collapsing, the supply demand shock uh, having an impact along with the secular trends um, in the high yield space, which is where we look, energy is about 12 percent of the index. Mm -hmm. So it's actually an area of heightened concern for us because of the long term as well as the short term effects. And, and, just, and again, the, I, where oil prices are here now, they were there for about 30 percent of last year. They were below that year before there was no coronavirus. 50 to 70 in oil prices has been where it's been for four or five years with or without these other transitory things. Well, like I said, coronavirus will end up going away and there will be something else that puts oil at the low 50 level. But you guys are also have different like assets. I mean, are you talking about big oil versus, say, U.S. E&Ps? Because obviously the high yield market is going to be exposed to U.S. E&Ps, which have right. a whole different value proposition. I completely than agree. I, I'm versus with, like an integrated. I'm with, I, or, I'm with Kathy entirely of the credit side and high yield. Yeah. We don't touch the EMP and high yield. Uh, the Chevrons and Exxons of the world are a completely different story on the equity side. By the right. way, you're getting a higher dividend from the stock of Exxon than you are from owning high yield bonds in the energy space. Uh, joining me now is Rick Davis, Bloomberg contributor and former manager of John McCain's presidential campaign, Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab, David Bonson of the Bonson Group, uh, still with me as well. I mean, I watched the first hour and it felt like a dogfight. Uh, what was your takeaway? Yeah, it was uh, much more entertaining than the previous eight Democratic uh, I missed those uh, last day, I'm yeah. not going to lie. Well, and, and so did <laughs> most people, right? I think, you know, 18 million people tuned into the very first one and it's been a declining curve ever since then. So last night, I think you saw a real campaign starting. Um, uh, prior to this, you wondered, did anybody really want to win this election? And last night you saw people, you know, throwing themselves into each other and sort of colliding objects in order to try and strip away their their votes. It wasn't one of these things where you say, well, you got to just make your positive pitch and and voters will rally around you. What you saw last night was uh, candidates looking to the right, looking to the left of themselves ideologically and saying, I have to take your votes tonight or I lose. Did someone win? Well, I think Donald Trump won. Uh, Anybody who watched that debate from start to finish had to say, wow, what a train wreck. Uh, I think Michael Bloomberg did say that. Yeah, and and, and (laughs) this is always the this is always the danger of these kinds of debates where you get into this cycle of the campaign where you have to strip away votes from other people to consolidate the field. And it just is a messy process. You're making sausage. Nobody likes to watch that happen. Rick, didn't you feel, though, that that it was very bizarre how nobody would go after Bernie Sanders besides Mayor Pete, that 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 for all the attacking and fighting that was going on, Senator Klobuchar at Mayor Pete, Elizabeth Warren, to basically everybody, all of them, especially at Michael Bloomberg. But Bernie Sanders is in the lead. And and first of all, I'm a conservative Republican and, and I never took advice from from Democrats about how we should be handling our races. And I don't think they want advice for me now, but I don't understand. 
understand why the first place person gets ignored. I watched Cruz and Rubio and Jeb Bush do it with right. Trump, and now and Jeb won the nomination. Are and, they? and this chart showing that. So this white line here shows uh, Bernie Sanders' probability of the next Democratic nominee. The red line uh, is Bloomberg sort of rolling over there, and even Biden, the blue line, uh, continues to roll. It over. just seems that there's yeah. the most extremist candidate uh, who has the least chance of defeating President Trump is the one that all of them seem to be afraid to go after. Yeah, I think it even goes deeper than that. I think the hmm. Democratic Party is in a bit of a turmoil because the other big winner besides Donald Trump last night was the socialist wing of the Democratic Party. It wasn't just Bernie. Who touched Elizabeth Warren? She had a free ride last night. I mean, here she is sort of limping along. She's desperate for any kind of delegate support. Uh, the next two states, either she starts get delegates or she's out of the race. And yet nobody piled on her. And so those two individuals had a free run basically to say, hey, socialism is better than what anybody else on the, the middle of our party is claiming uh, is, is a positive. So as a market participant, how do you see it? Because I wanted to show uh, the chart again. So it, the purple line was Elizabeth Warren, right? And we saw sort of in September uh, her rise in the polls before she unveiled sort of uh, her health care for all plan. And at the same time, it coincided with uh, a sell off in the market. And there was some rhetoric that perhaps if she gains in the polls, you're going to want to sell stocks. Like, is that I don't believe it. I just don't believe that mar that, that correlation is causative. That, that 11 months out, 14 months out, uh -huh. the markets know these things are so fluid. And at the time, you had Federal Reserve activity and trade war activity that are far more logical explanations of what markets may have been doing either way. There Our forecast on the year, and I, I'd be curious what Kathy thinks in the fixed income space, I think that it's a, almost non-issue until late summer. And then we expect enhanced volatility in the second half of the year, regardless of exactly who the candidate is and where the poll are. I just think it's going to be a close election. Um, right now, it appears that President Trump has, has more mo uh, momentum than he had a few months back. Certainly, I think he was the winner last night. Mm -hmm. But as far as markets trying to price in, not just what happens with the primary and then the general, but also the Senate. Because let's say Bernie Sanders does somehow win the presidency, but the Republicans keep the Senate. That's a very different market outcome as well. So there's a lot of moving parts. Kathy? Yeah, I, I think the uh pundits, myself included, probably try to read too much into the political environment in terms of its correlation. I would agree with market activity. Um, we also, you know, remember, nobody expected Donald Trump to win, and nor did they expect the outcome of the market after he won. So um, I think it's just way too early to try to place market bets on who's going to be in the White House, particularly when we don't know if the Senate and the Congress, you know, are, are still divided, nothing gets done, so nothing changes. I would say last night, though, was an interesting uh, event occurred, and that was one of the last questions by Chuck Todd about whether or not uh, you agreed that the convention should uh, appoint whoever uh, comes mm -hmm. out in the back end of it, not necessarily who comes in with the most delegates if there's not a majority. And, and, and the entire field said, uh, no, the convention should uh, make its wisdom and pick the right candidate, and Bernie Sanders completely different from four years ago where he said no the convention should decide this thing because the front runner was hillary clinton when he's the front runner what is his response last night hey whoever goes into the convention with the most delegates should win so complete flip-flop but but what that told me was the rest of the field standing there thinks bernie sanders is going to come into that convention with the most delegates and and is preemptively trying to be in a position to override that and the problem there for them is they could prevail and succeed and get a more electable candidate as a nominee but have such a divided party and have alienated the bernie wing so badly that it almost won't matter right because you can make the argument that anyone who's really what the sanders bros is that yeah, what bernie, bros. Bernie, bernie bros bernie bros yeah. Like I'm the, glad you don't know that. That, <laughs> <laughs> that makes me happy, yeah. too. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, but like, they're not going to all of a sudden go and like switch their votes to Buttigieg. Well, like, here's, that, here's the question. Not, There's one candidate on that yeah. stage whose people will not vote for the other candidate or has a big yeah. portion of them, and that's Bernie Sanders. Well, it'll be interesting because Trump is a galvanizing figure, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so as more mm -hmm. Trump His becomes galvanizing, night, right? it kind of unifies the Democrats. And so don't underestimate that. Yeah. The real question that should have been asked of Bernie last night is if you go into the convention with the most delegates and you don't get the nomination, do you walk out or do you join whoever is the nominee? Yeah. That would have put him in a tough spot. And, and I think that what this does do, Kathy, even though if it's hard to hedge now, is that it does wind up looking at where we go from growth and a growth perspective. Like, is, is a base case no matter who gets it, we're going to see stimulus, or no matter who gets it, we're not going to get any stimulus? Uh, and that sort of helps or hurts where we get to a 3% growth handle. Yeah, I, you know, getting to 3% is going to be hard no matter who's in any office because we have an um, you know, aging population and now we've cut off immigration. So mm -hmm. the math doesn't work. I don't know if anybody 
else noticed, but in the last um, employment report, the census adjustment showed 811,000 fewer people in uh, the count, which means that subtracts from GDP immediately. And so a change in immigration policy might have the biggest impact on economic growth uh, rather than, you know, anything else that happens. I think that the biggest issue that will get us to a three-handle will be a resurgence of, of capital expenditures, business investment. Mm -hmm. And so to the extent the trade war calms down and maybe even improves, um, and what you could potentially see happen politically, and maybe I'm just talking my political book here, but maybe Bernie becomes the, not, the candidate and there really is a huge resurgence the other way where the Republicans take back the House mm -hmm. and they can get tax reform 2.0 done they, and some of these other deregulatory measures that would be more stimulative. I am totally with Kathy. A three handle is going to be hard, but it is achievable. It would have happened had it not been for the trade war. But I don't think you need a three handle to keep earnings growth going. We've been getting great earnings growth with a one and two handle. So we'll, we've we'll see. Had, we've had huge fiscal stimulus. I mean, it wasn't just tax cuts. It's huge increases in, in defense spending. We've had um, huge deregulatory moves, and we're still at about a 1.8 growth rate. I'm not convinced that more of that does anything that's but my pile point. up our debt. Mm -hmm. And that's my point, though, as an equity guy, is that with only 1 to 2 to 3 percent GDP growth, we've been getting 40 percent earnings growth over the last four years. And, and not all of that is from tax reform. Revenue growth, top line, has been monumental. So there's kind of two different things going on but there. I, I do think one of the things that is starting to emerge is when you start comparing Bernie's economic plans with Trump's, I mean, the two of them have a, a, actually a lot of parallels. It's not the traditional... Mm -hmm. You know, American uh, Republicans are internationalists. We believe in, you know, multilateral trade agreements. Not this president. He actually sounds a lot like Bernie Sanders when it comes to trade. It's when it comes to even health care. I mean, we pay our way out of this thing. What's Donald Trump say? I'm not touching Social Security. I'm not touching Medicare. I'm not touching Medicaid. Um, so you, you, you actually see a lot of parallels in their economic policy. So I, I wouldn't think that you're going to have a big dislocation because of Bernie. Bernie would, I think, affect more the uh, the private side, right? Are you really going to invest yeah. a lot if you think a big tax uh, 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 bill is going to come your way, especially on the wealth class, uh, which he has promised since the day he began this campaign? So where is your going to cap? But where's your capital going to go? I think that's where the Senate comes in. Bernie can say all of that, but I just don't believe there's anyone I talk to that actually thinks there are 51 senators, let alone 60, they're going to vote for a wealth tax. That are going to vote for Medicare for all. They're going to vote for that's Green right. New Deal. So Mitch McConnell's made it very clear, right? I mean, he was able to stop legislation during the Obama administration when there were even thinner margins yeah. in the United States yeah. Senate. And, uh, and he's been able to keep the, the legislative program going even during a tumultuous Trump administration. Yeah. So, you know, ironically, America can depend upon Mitch McConnell potentially in the future. All right, guys, really fun conversation. I super appreciate that. Uh, Bloomberg contributor Rick Davis, good to finally meet you on set. I appreciate it. And Kathy Jones and Charles Schwab and David Bonson of the Bonson Group. The guys, thanks a lot for the dynamic conversation. I appreciate it. All right, we